Center for Korean Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. My name is Taeyong Baek, the director of this center and the professor of law at the William S. Richardson School of Law. I'm very pleased to announce the opening of the third Korea Vision Dialogue with a distinguished guest, Professor Ji Hyun Lim from Sogang University. I had met Professor Lim a long time ago at Harvard University when both of us were visiting scholars there. I'm very pleased to see him again in person today here in Hawaii. In fact, this is the first hybrid event that we are hosting after the pandemic started. And you will see what amazing job our center staffs, uh, including Marishi Courtney Hamin and others, and Professor Harrison Kim had uh, achieved. Today, Professor Lim will be speaking with a title, uh, The Present as a History, being moderated by Professor Harrison Kim. Previous two Korea Vision Dialogue events had happened with uh, Minister In Young Lee, Yi Nyong, and uh, Professor Alexis Durden and other scholars with a focus on Korea pro peace process and comfort women issues. Today's dialogue will capture some of the ongoing discussions that we had in previous dialogue events and will address the current uh, historical problems, broadening our scope of discussion to think the future of Korean visions. As you know, Asia and the two Koreas are facing critical moments in handling decades-long stalemates of nuclear uh, security threats, hurdles achieving permanent peace, reconciliation, and cooperation among states in the region. We have seen multiple summits that had gone on between the United States president and the North Korean president, between the leaders of the two Koreas, and also between China and North Korea and so forth. However, we still do not know what will be happening in the coming month and uh, what course of action is ahead of us in the solutions to the problems and challenges. All related actors, in my opinion, should try harder to find a way to end the current Korean war-based Cold War inedited systems by finding a way to resolve nuclear weapon issues, adoption of the end of war declaration, and a peace treaty. The relationship between South Korea and Japan and the two Koreas and China and the United States and the regional actors are still being evolved in Northeast Asia. It should be headed toward a regional peace and cooperative regime rather than a regime with tensions, antagonisms, nor it should go back to the revival of Cold War regime. We witness all the historical issues are re-emerging between Korea and Japan. How to deal with the serious human rights violations such as uh, comfort women or forced labor are still uh, not very clear and remaining as a big problem. The San Francisco Peace Treaty of 1952 and the 1965 uh, basic treaties between Japan and South Korea, security challenges in South China Sea, etc., uh, are being revisited. We also are witnessing serious regressions of a democracy and human rights regimes in many Asian countries, including Myanmar, Hong Kong, and other places. Aggressive nationalism seems to be serving as an underlying 
background to many of these problems. I believe the hope lies in the dynamic activities of civil society organizations. We know that people in Myanmar have not given up. And that the Milk Tea Alliance in Asia, for example, are trying to support the fight. People in Hong Kong are still trying to support fundamental rights and freedoms. In Korea, we also see activities to pursue peace on Korean Peninsula, to achieve gender e equality, to end state-sponsored violence, and uh, strengthening due process and rights and freedom. I believe we should not be frustrated from the existing problems, because the problems could be rather a source of hope. We should cultivate our hope by constantly talking to each other, developing our intellectual visions for changes. In this regard, I'm looking forward to learn uh, from learning from uh, today's dialogue with our wise guest, Professor Jihan Lim, and also Professor Harrison Kim. Thank you very much. I am honored to be introducing the speaker. So Professor Jian Lim is currently Professor of um, Transnational History at Sogang University in South Korea. He's also the Director of Critical Global Studies Institute at the same university. Um, he has um, led big projects in the past. Uh, he began as a historian of Poland, uh, but of course, um, he has uh, his research interest, his passion, is, um, has really taken him across the globe, including the issues of mass dictatorship, history of everyday life, and currently the issue of memory, history, and solidarity. Um, he has written broadly as well for both academia and for the public, uh, with over 20 books. Um, he is currently South Korea's leading public historian, and uh, we're really happy that he was able to uh, come to Hawaii. Um, with his magnanimous personality, he has created bridges among hundreds of scholars across the world. You know, and uh, on a personal note, um, when I was a uh, graduate researcher, um, he re welcomed me into his research institute and shared his resources with me. Um, let's welcome Professor Jian Lim. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Lim, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, how's uh, how's your journey here? Uh, how... It's very good. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Are you enjoying your stay here? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we're so happy to have you here today. So, just to begin, um, could you tell us about this notion of the present as a historical problem? Mm -hmm. So, is this notion related to the concept and practice of historical memory? What are some examples from your research or from your institute? Um, is this a kind of a return of old historical issues to the present? Is there a, are you developing a, some kind of a historical transnational theory behind this notion? Um, please. Yeah, but first of all, I, I'd like to express my thanks for warm welcoming uh, by Professor Bek and also your very kind introduction. And uh, to be honest, present as history is a title of the book written by a Paul M. Suizi, who was a very famous American Marxist economist, also who was one of those a American military officers, new dealers, who, who has a station in, in, in Japan after the Second World War. So in a sense, he was related with uh, post-war East Asian history. Mm -hmm. 
But present as history is, has a connotation of a sort of presentism in approaching history as a Marxist economist, you know. I got that sense too. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, but I think that the present as history is a rather rhetoric more than a very precise, accurate definition of uh, any conception. But as for rhetorics, present as history, I think, has uh, multiple meanings. First of all, yes, that presentism as a poem series had thought in titling his book, Present as History. So it is neither monumental history in terms of Nietzsche nor antiquarian uh, approach to history. I, I'm not interested in history per se as a sort of what happened in the past. But as a as German, as German uh, memory scholars used to say that it's about the past which has become the future. So past is always a sort of indicator to show what the future can be or should be, may be. So in that sense, a present as history has a connotation of present. But second meaning, I think, is uh, more broadly, one can imagine very easily by the terms of the uh, present as history, modern history or contemporary history. It's the history of the uh, epoch in which we are living in, right? So, so it can be un also understood as a contemporary history. But what I meant by using the term of present as history is the, this third approach means that, you know, in France, a, a, in 1980s, I think, it was 1980s, Henri Rousseau, who is a very famous historian and also memory studies scholars, who wrote a book of Vichy Syndrome, right? It's a quite, quite important book in the um, making sort of um, combined studies of memory studies and contemporary history in France. So Henri Rousseau established a institute called Institut uh, Histoire d'un Présent. It means the Institute of the a History of Present Time. So usually... A, a English-speaking people used to translate it into Institute of Contemporary History. But Henri Rousseau has complained of that translation because the history of present time, he meant it's a memory because it is the memory about the past, right? Past is what has been done in the past. But memory of the past is in the making now. So when he called the, uh, the history of present time, what he meant was the memory. So actually, our memory of the past is in the making. It depending on the current political situation or social conditions and the cultural atmosphere. So in a sense, past was past, but our memory of the past is always in the making, you know, in the present time. You know, often in a um, history class, mm -hmm. um, a presentist view is seen as a, a negative method to avoid. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that you want to place yourself in the historical time in that context and mm -hmm. not use your present lens. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but, but in your case, you're actually not seeing it as a, as a negative method, but something that could um, reveal something more. Yeah, some historians, it can be a very negative method, but for me, I think this is a really important, important goal of historians. So I do, nowadays, I do define myself as a memory activist as well as a historian, yes. because in a sense, you know, history and work contribute to making the memories of the contemporary societies. So I'm, I'm rather skeptical of the traditional positivistic stance about history. Mm. History is always in the making in the present time. So even ancient history is a sort of part of contemporary history because we are making the image of the ancient history, right? So past is always, always in the making. That's, that's my viewpoint. And also this is the moment exactly when memory studies can meet history or historical studies. So, so this kind of a, a critical um, paradigm, mm -hmm. what you're saying, can be applied to even 
um, ancient historians, yes, pre-modern historians, yeah, yeah. and yeah, and sure. across the the, the regions. Yeah. I, th I yeah. think that, for example, ancient history, you have a look at the Korean, right. the right. controversies of ancient history. Yes. Yes. It's a very much politically oriented it's memory debate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. very yes. much memory-centered yes. one, right? Yes. Nobody yes. had lived in that period. The, the historians who are talking about ancient history, they yes. never yes. lived in the, you know, in the Shilla or Baekje or even Goguryeo. But they are talking of this. What does it mean? Yeah. Uh, so um, at the same time, are you um, including your your um, um, lifelong passion of critiquing state actors and and the state itself? Are you also bringing that in into this kind of research? Yeah, sure, sure. So the so the so so your your um, so this is what kind of made you notorious and famous, right? Your your criticism <laughs> of the nation state. Yeah. So that is still very much part of this project. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Because, you know, in the, when I was um, criticizing national history as a paradigm in history writings, I thought, yes, it could be okay uh, as a tool to criticize nation state format. Mm. But after that, I found that people usually learn history of, or people usually get the historical imagination not by historians, uh, the academic books, but by novels and TV dramas and the cinemas, of course, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. So even mangas, yes. cartoons, yeah. animations. Yeah. So then, if we are losing the battle to to get the people for the historical imagination on my side, what can we do? So that's the this this point of when I began to think seriously of moving towards memory no, studies. Memory activism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. That's it. I see. Thank you. Um, uh, let's start with the topic of um, Japanese colonial legacies mm -hmm. and their current reverberations. Mm -hmm. So the issue of sexual slavery, the so-called comfort women's system, is highly contentious problem once again, and so is the issue of forced labor. Uh, we can also include the issues of Japanese textbook, um, the Yasukuni Shrine memorialization, the problem of reparation from the colonial period. So these are ongoing issues in South Korea and Japan as well for the past three decades. And the international community too has been dealing with these issues as well. So, so my question to you is, so I know that you and your research team have dealt with the issues of Japanese colonialism's legacy and memory. And currently, maybe just finished, your center had an exhibit on Korean workers in Japan during the colonial era. Yeah. So from the issue of the comfort women to Japanese textbooks, to South Korea's dictionary of pro-Japan collaborators, um, what do you think is um, the core of the problem of colonialism's current constant return to the present. Why is it always coming back? Is it a matter of South Korea's inadequate decolonization? Is it a matter of research, proper research? Is it a matter of South Korea's nationalist agenda? Or is it a matter of the Japanese government's own shortcomings? And they have plenty of shortcomings there too. Um, my own sense, it's all of these, but could you offer some kind of a comprehensive explanatory lens to make sense of the ongoing problems remaining from the colonial period? And also, um, what about the civil society? I get the sense that, the, that sometimes civil society gets caught up with um, the state agenda um, as as much as it wants to be apart from it. Um, so what's your sense on these issues? Yeah, your question is very much comprehensive. Also, also I think that your question itself uh, constitutes a sort of answer. So actually, all these factors are intermingled in the understanding today's memory was in East Asia. Mm. You know, as you see, many of us see the East Asia is a very dense minefield for memories. Mm. So we cannot 
escape from that minefield while we are living, while we are talking, or while we are studying mm -hmm. about East Asia, wherever. But if, if I remember correctly, in 1960s, 70s, and 80s, when we are studying histories, for example, the comfort women question and the forced labors, it didn't matter. We never learned about the comfort women or forced labor in the Japanese colonial period, right? So the comfort women issue became public in 1991 when the Kim Hak-sun, right? She made it to public, in public her experience. And forced labor has been, that memory has been also very much suppressed in South Korea, even, even South Korea by the late 1980s. And also, so it's, one can see that these are very recent topics. I think, why? And also, Yasukuni Shrine, you know, if you have a look at the Korean newspapers in 1970s, there's no mention at all about Yasukuni Shrine. The first mention about the Yasukuni Shrine was in 1978. At the time, the Fukuta Takeo was the uh, Japanese, pro Japanese prime minister, and the, he visited uh, Yasukuni Shrine for the first time in 1978. Mm -hmm. But the Korean uh, newspapers just you know, reported about his visit to Yasukuni Shrine with a very mild critical tone. Mm -hmm. So they didn't think that it was a really serious one. And also, you know, in the 1977, a Dong also has an interview with a Japanese poet who tried very much to commemorate Jap the Korean the conscripts or Korean volunteers, mm. deceased who are deceased in the war in the Yasukuni Shrine, mm. and the Korean journalists were very much you know how can I sympathetic to his efforts to hold the Korean uh, deceased in the Yasukuni Shrine. Then suddenly in 1980s we began to find we 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 found that the Korean attitude towards these uh, colonial things began to change. Why? So my, my, my argument is that actually Japanese memory culture, yes, it has been a really a, a nationalized very much in 1980s, especially in the Nakasone, Nakasone's mm -hmm. term of uh, prime minister. But what is more than that is that the Korean and the Chinese or East Asian neighbors sensitivity about the Japanese memory culture has been very sharpened in 1980s. Before that, for example, you know, if you have a look at the Japanese history textbooks in 19, mid, from the mid 1950s till early 1970s, these textbooks are really terrible. It is more terrible than the uh, Atarashi Kyokasho, it's a new history textbook in the, uh, recently made by the Japanese right-wing, uh, you know, historians, divisionist historians, right? But at the time, Koreans and the Chinese, they never ever concerned about the history textbooks in Japan. They didn't, they, simply they didn't care what kind of textbooks are used in Japan. But suddenly they are concerned or their interest in the Japanese history, history textbooks had become increased in the, in the 1980s. So 1982, we see the, for the first time a certain mm. criticism from Korea and, Japan, Korea and China mm. against the Japanese new history textbook censorship. But that censorship turn has been done already in 1995, 1955, 56. We call it a Akka Gyokasho criticism. Akka Gyokasho is a red, red textbooks. So after the after the turn of the military government, American military government, the Japanese government tried to make Japanese history textbooks into a more nationalistic or patriotic one. They used the term of national nihilism. So textbooks used under the American military rule has a, contained a sort of national nihilistic national nihilism towards the Japanese past. So they wanted to remake textbooks into the nationalist one. But at the time, no neighbors complained of this. I don't know if they did know this change or not. But what is important that is they didn't concern about these books. 
But certainly in 1980s, we, we could see the uh, witness a certain increasing concern about the Japanese history textbooks in Japan and China. I think this is a good sign. You know, being noisy or being certain vociferous about the situation is a good sign, much more than the silence. Before that, you are silent. But now people began to be recognizing that Oh, these Japanese history textbooks may influence East Asian future, right? And also, it is this is a national concern. It has been, but this is more than national. So, what kind of history textbooks are Japanese using is a very important point for Koreans and Chinese too. Vice versa, what kind of history textbooks in Korea and China are used? is also East Asian concern. So when the Koreans criticized Japanese history textbooks in the mid-1980s, this Nakasone-like uh, Japanese nationalist uh, the, uh, uh, politicians claimed against that intervention as a sort of you know, violation of national sovereignty. This is Japanese history textbook. It's our national sovereignty. And you Koreans and Chinese, you do not have the right to command us to revise history textbooks this way, that way. If we stick to the principle of national sovereignty, they are, I mean, they are claim has certain, you know, has certain a grain of truth. But problem is that in 1980s already we people in East Asia began to recognize that their lives are really entangled so closely. So Japanese history textbook is always already more than Japanese. It's a sort of East Asian one. So I think that that's the beginning of the memory war in East Asia. So in that sense, it's a good, I think, good sign, at least to show that East Asians now began to recognize their past it's not their own national past. It is already sort of transnational past in which all the people in, who are living in East Asia have a stake in their common past. So, so what you're saying is that um, um, there was a, some kind of a moment of change, a transition mm -hmm. in the 1980s, um, beginning in Japan, where there's a resurgence of nationalism. Mm -hmm. as, as a resistance against kind of a U.S. imperialism's writing of its own history. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, uh, with the kind of a liberalization of other countries in East Asia, um, uh, knowledge becomes kind of shared and criticized mm -hmm. in this region mm -hmm. as a whole. Is this kind of what your observation is? Yeah, yeah. I mean that the... In a sense, in East Asia, globalization in 1980s meant a sort of globalization of memory, right? This globalization, yes, of course, it always carried such globalization of multinational corporations and the, you know, free free move of uh, capitals and the laborers and so on. But from the viewpoint of intellectual history, I think that the 1980s in East Asia can be recorded as a globalization of memories. Mm -hmm. So people began to be interested in the neighboring countries' past and neighboring countries' history education. Mm -hmm. So I think that's at least a good sign because we can think of faster program with us, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. I think that's very incisive. Um, mm -hmm. What about the current issues? So you've been following and you, you have written about the current issues in South Korea today. Mm -hmm. What's your sense uh, with the, um, uh, the comfort women, forced labor, the return of these major problems, yeah. unresolved problems? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think uh, this current issue has uh, quite ambivalent connotations. On the one hand, I think it's a very good sign to show that our sense, sensitivity about the human rights it's really sort of. So, you know, in 19, till the 1980s, comfort Human women rights. or comfort women, people used to think this is sort of, you know, collateral damage, mm -hmm. right? That can be done in the, in the world times. But certainly with the comfort women issue, we could see that 
rise of our sense about the women's human rights, right? This is a violation of women's human rights. This is not the collateral damage. And this is a really from the viewpoint of uh, human rights, universal human rights, we could see the approach, we could approach to the comfort of women issue. And I think this is a very good sign. And the forced labor, for, as for the forced labor, we can see the same thing. And even in Germany, the forced reparation of the East European, the forced laborers under the Nazi regime, was done only in the year 2000, quite late compared to Holocaust victims, right? So in East Asia, also the, our, our, our sensitivity of the forced labor was done with a very, a, how can I say, so very high speed of uh, universal human rights. Mm -hmm. This is a positive aspect. But on the other hand, I think that my thesis of victim of nationalism uh, interprets this phenomenon also. It's a sign of a change of nationalist discourses. You know, the, by the end of 20th century, usually many of nationalist discourse has been uh, depending on the hero, right? Hero, hero discourses has been dominant in nationalist discourse. Yi Sun Shin and Kang Gam Chan and all the, all the national heroes who fought against foreign invaders. But certainly, certainly with the globalization of memory, we could see the, uh, the, the rise of the regime of the victim of nationalism everywhere in Israel, of course, in Poland, in Eastern Europe, who were liberated from the Stalinist yoke, and also some post-colonial states, and also the formation of global global memory formation. With the with the global memory formation, usually global civil society or global public sphere it has been very much concerned about victims, right? So certainly some nationalists began to recognize that, oh, the position of victims is very comfortable to promote their nationalist code. So, so the comfort women issue and the forced labor issue is actually two, two opposite tendencies are involved in that issue. means that one, this first one is deterritorializing these memories for the uh, promoting universal human rights. But on the other hand, re-territorializing these memories to promote their nationalism in the age of the globalization of memories. So this ambivalence can be found in these current issues of memory. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, think, um, I think your line of thinking um, could also get someone like you in hot water. Have you, have you experienced that in the past where, where you are um, criticizing not, not only, for example, Japan's imperial machine, mm -hmm. but you're also, you're also critical of Korean's own construction of its memory? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, you know, I think that there is a very big chain, great worldwide chain, global chain of this relationship between perpetrators and victims. For example, Japan, Japanese, uh, the memory cost has always regarded itself as a victim of the American imperialism or European imperialism, right? And also, Yuichi Nashibakuoku, the only uh, country which atomic bomb, right? This actually consisted of the Japanese victim. So vis-a-vis -vis United States, Japan has been always victims, but vis-a-vis -vis Korea, also Japan has been the perpetrators. But once this Japanese uh, memory culture is obsessed with the Japanese-American relationship, they could not think of uh, Japan was a perpetrator to East Asian neighbors. This is a real the, the start, start of the problem, right? But I think the same thing can be happening to Korean the memory culture. Vis-a-vis -vis Japan, yes, Korean has been, Korean nation has been victimized, but vis-a-vis -vis some other, other not stronger nations in Asia, especially in the post-war era, 
the couriers, so in a sense, had been perpetrators in some sense, to some extent. Um, related to that topic, uh, let's move on to um, South Korea's own long history of state violence. Mm -hmm. uh, this is also something that um, um, you have been thinking about for a long time. Mm -hmm. So the image of the clash between the police and street protesters is an indelible mark of South Korea's modern history. Mm -hmm. And one can make a further assessment that South Korea's... Um, state's own history has been defined by its suppression and crackdown of leftists, mm -hmm. socialists, communists, radicals, anarchists, and even people who are vaguely tied to these categories. Um, in many ways, South Korean state identity is about suppression, in a way. Um, and we can mention here um, the tragic events of 48 Jeju, the Korean War, situation of mass killings, and so forth, Inc even um, the Vietnam War, the Gwangju, 1980. Um, and of course, at the center of this kind of history is the national security law. So my question is kind of long-winded. Um, the South Korean government and its public are gradually coming to terms and working toward resolving its history. Uh, what do you think are the priorities here? So what, do you, what are the proper steps? So, so is it memorialization, recognition, recognition of the events of the past, and maybe even reparation toward the victims? Is it a change in South Korea's own textbooks about its own past? Mm -hmm. How important is it for South Korea to recognize its own past of violence and suppression? Um, so this kind of state operation still goes on today. So, for example, the former assembly member Isaki is still incarcerated. Um, so, do you think? What do you think about this law? Is is it is it time that this law is is dissolved soon? And what about South Korea's uh, violence and atrocities, frankly, in Vietnam? So, as South Korea and civil society demand justice for Korean victims of Japanese imperial system, should they not also help bring justice to the Vietnamese people? Mm -hmm. um, an internationalist spirit would demand justice on both peoples here. What's your sense? Yeah, I want to answer in the um, reversed way the, to your final from your final question to the first question. I mean, Vietnam or the in general the the state violence in South Korea after the Second World War I think can be located in the global context. Means that I think it's a part of the political genocide in the Cold War era, right? Usually, if you have a look at Eastern Europe, you can see also the tremendous uh, the state violence. But that was done, perpetrated by the leftist political power. In South Korea, on the other hand, in the opposite way, all the state violence was done, perpetrated by the uh, right-wing political power. But if, you, if we broaden our perspective into really global, global history or global Cold War, then we can see that the state, there were two different state violences the leftist one and the rightist one. So ordinary people usually have suffered from that state violence. Mm. So first of all, we can see this uh, South Korean the state violence in the broader political genocide that has been prevalent in the Cold War era. You mean it was happening universally yeah, in right. all regions? Yeah, in yeah. most of all the countries, except some colonialist mm. centers, countries, right? And the second one, secondly, mm. I think that this, for example, you know, without Vietnam, I, I cannot imagine the Guangzhou. Because, you know, the, usually the Korean black bearers were special airborne troops, right? Many of them, especially a professional troops, they are experienced in Vietnam. So, you know, killing innocent civilians is not the easy one. So once a taboo was broken, in Vietnam, 
rather it was a rather, you know, not that terribly difficult for them to kill their own civilians in Gwangju. So in a sense, in a sense, killing civilians in Gwangju is related with their experience in Vietnam. So apology to Vietnamese people is not just a moralist one. Also, it is one of the ways to understand why such a terrible thing happened to Gwangju in 1980. So in that sense, this political a genocide or a state of violence is related or it has traveled from one country to other country in the Cold War era. So this is a, one of the very important points, I think. And the other one... And, and in that respect... I'm sorry, cut, cut no, you No, no, it's off. okay. In that respect, your argument also is similar to someone like Kim Dong-chun, mm -hmm. who makes an argument that um, the Korean War and the violence from the Korean War has really never yeah. ended. No, no, yeah. no. But also, you know, if you ever look at even Holocaust, the, uh, the recent his German historiography now began to talk about the Namibia. Because in between 1904-1908, there was a sort of genocide of Herero and Nama people in Namibia. So all those German colonial, colonial troops who are experienced in killing you know, native uh, Namibians in 1904-1908. In a sense, there is a continuity of this tradition of killing people from German colonies to the Eastern Europe uh, in the during the Second World War. So this genocide is not just you know separated one; it is related. And also, when I've been to this ESMA, it, this is uh, Argentinian the uh, memory site of the. A, a, this uh, Argentinian military dictatorship, I could see evidently a perpetrators. These Argentinian torturers learned uh, torturing from the French troops first, at first. These French troops were experienced in killing and torturing people in Algeria. And then CIA people and American the experts taught those Argentinians. And then these Argentinians also had a very close relationship with uh, apartheid South Africa. I could see the move of, of the uh, former director of ESMA in the Buenos Aires. After his term, he went to South Africa, no, the Argentina embassy in South Africa. So we could see a certain visible ring of perpetrators in the Cold War era. So I mean that we need to, if we really understand the, uh, the state violence in South Korea, we really need to understand the global, global Cold War and the certain uh, context. And the other one, the national security law, I think, this cannot stand for long. But you know, perhaps Professor Beck oh, yes. might know much better, but you know, even Immediately after the American Revolution in 1979 or 1780, you know, there was an argument about the Sedition Act, right? So, so all the political power of nation state, in a sense, they cannot resist the temptation to make a, this sort of Sedition Act or a national security law. So there is a, has been always a tension between political power and the civil society. But if the civil society can control, I think that law, you know, will be, yeah, yeah. But the, on the other hand, I'm worrying about the memory role in the contemporary South Korea, which has been, you know, made by the so-called formal democratization movement leaders. Actually, when they are making this law to punish the negationist of uh, Gwangju, its, its clauses are very similar to national security law. Means that for the very vague, vague rationales, they'd like to punish those negationists. I think that negationism and denialism is a real problem. But on the other hand, I think Korean civil society is ripe enough to deal with these sort of negationist or deniers in a quite regional way. So we don't need that sort of legislation. But 
one can see the very strange continuity of the spirit of national security law into the so-called uh, memory laws in South Korea that is promoted by the by the formal democratization. Uh, in an inverted kind of way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But politically, it's totally different. But underlying assumption mm. is very similar. That's a real problem, I think. You know, Jihan, um, so I think you're bringing up a, uh, a very controversial topic here. Um, mm, yeah, I know. I, it's controversial. Yeah. Huh? I think South Korean government, for example, mm -hmm. is, is looking at other places as models of dealing with um, tragic pasts. So, for mm -hmm. example, Germany, mm -hmm. um, where... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you cannot falsely write about mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Holocaust mm -hmm, past, mm -hmm, for example. Mm -hmm. Is, isn't South Korea trying to do that kind of a legislative act, create mm -hmm. that kind of legislative mm -hmm, context, mm -hmm. where where you cannot just uh, make up stories mm -hmm. about the past? Mm -hmm. But but what you're saying is that that South South Korea civil society will check itself. Yeah, we should in those terms. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And that this is also kind of a state violence. No, not just state violence, but it has a potential to restrict uh, basic rights of the expression and thought, freedom of expression and thought, and something like that, right? So it's the German, the Auschwitz law, is also, in, in my view, is very problematic. So in, in Europe now, there's certain a young group of scholars who began to very phosphorously speak out against memory laws in Europe. Mm. Because, for example, they are punishing the deniers of Holocaust mm. while they are tolerant of deniers of Armenian genocide. Mm. Mm. What's, what's the standard to, dis, to differentiate between two deniers? Mm. Armenian genocide is nothing compared to Holocaust. I don't think so, right? So, I mean, this is a really, in, in many sense, these memory laws are problematic. Also, on the other hand, also, it leaves the final decision to the lawyers about history. Mm. So we don't have to study history then, okay? The judges and lawyers, they will make a final decision about the right interpretation of the history. And also, it may lead to a sort of legal positive, positivistic stance. This, in a sense, makes, will make the, our understanding of history very dry or very poor. Right? History or the past or people's lives are always very complicated. Right? It's, it's, it cannot be reduced to, to a very simple binary. But this memory laws also uh, has such a tendency. And nowadays in Europe, the memory laws are most prosperous in Poland and Hungary, mm. where the most authoritarian right-wing populist governments are dominating. Of course, their punishment, the object of their punishment is different. For example, in Poland, any, any historian who defames the honor of Polish nation can be punished. Mm. But what's the deformation of honor of Polish nation? It is very vague term, right? Yeah, so, so, so you know, this, is, um, this is fascinating. And this is something that I myself, I'm a mm -hmm. modern historian too, mm -hmm. and a historian of North Korea. This is something that I struggle with mm -hmm. um, constantly. So as, um, uh, you know, I would call you a... Uh, a a leftist um, scholar, mm -hmm. and you also have a um, 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 fondness for Marxism, mm -hmm. uh, you, at, at least in the past, um, you have been. Um, so, so even from that perspective, your position, um, you, you think we should allow, for example, um, the economic argument for comfort women's system. Um, you're, you're okay with the, the public um, um, spread of, of this kind of knowledge, for example, the Ramsayer uh, mm -hmm. kind, of, mm -hmm. kind of research. Mm -hmm. Well, he, he's just one of the body of this kind of yeah, economic yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. argument for, mm -hmm. for the comfort women's system. Mm -hmm. So as a leftist scholar, anti-imperial leftist scholar, mm -hmm. you, you, you think that should happen. 
No, I, I don't think that Ramjaya's argument is right. But our ways of dealing with Ramjaya's argument, you know, as you say, American historians, you said Alexei Dodon and the Andrew Gordon and the, you know, more than a dozen of American historians just bombarded Ramjaya. That's the best way of dealing with Ramjaya. But in Korea, they were saying that, oh, this, uh, the minister of the Yogabu, Ministry of uh, Women, should make a certain official statement to criticize Ramjaya. I don't think he, that he's a, such, a, such a big historian, right, that the Korean politicians should be engaged in. So American historians already, you know, just devastated his argument in a week, within a week. I think that's, that's the power of civil society. And it, it is a very good example to show how this can civil society deal with such a, such a thing. So in, even in Korean case, right, there was certain very famous or infamous book which argued for such a thing that you mentioned about regarding comfort women. Yes. But that book became very popular because someone brought that book to the court. Otherwise, that book could become you know, just uh, one of the very trivial books. Suddenly, in a sense, that sort of uh, uh, justice contributed to the noise marketing mm -hmm. of those deniers. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to help them to make a noise marketing of their books. Mm -hmm. I think Korean historical society, yes, it is still very poor in a sense, but I think the Korean historical society has a certain purifying uh, mechanisms mm -hmm. to you know, get, get those sort of things done among themselves. So it's the state intervention into these issues that could be very problematic. That could, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's my point. Yeah. It just contributed to the noise marketing. Right. Yes. You know, um, we should move on to uh, maybe some of the final questions. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're already getting some um, very interesting mm -hmm. inquiries, one from Gary Park. Um, but but before we get to that, yeah, okay. Ian, so I do want to cover North Korea mm -hmm. um, because this is this is a priority for the current government. Um, um, and yet for South Korea, dealing with North Korea is a major area of contention among the political parties. So, so any kind of engagement with North Korea is still vehemently opposed by the political right mm -hmm. today. Um, at the same time, you know, this is always tied to the so-called South Korea-US alliance, which is also becoming really outdated. Mm -hmm. So although there seems to be a public opinion that supports more integration um, and South Koreans want peace and some kind of mutual beneficial enga en engagement, at the level of political parties, this is such a major block, major barrier to any kind of consensus. Um, so my question for you is, uh, is engagement with North Korea in and of itself, important for South Korea's future. Um, for example, a peace treaty um, um, after the Korean War itself. Um, is this one way to deal with the animosity or the political gridlock? So is the question of North Korea, is it still a historical question of how South Koreans change their perception and understanding of the entire world. Um, so in this sense, do you think there is some kind of a historical regression related to the question of North Korea? Historical regression? Huh. Well, I mean, why, why is, for example, why is the right and the left on, on the topic of North Korea still so different and opposed? Mm. But first of all, I'm not sure if uh, Korean right-wing party does not include unification as a part of their party program. Mm. Perhaps no political party in South Korea would deny the unification as a goal 
or ultimate goal or imminent goal or something like that, it might be different. But even the ultra right wing party would not deny unification as a goal. Yes, yes. Right? Yes. So, in that sense, uh, theoretically, all of those parties are for unification. Mm -hmm. But I think that they are different in regarding the methods of unification. I think that the already, you know, after the, uh, the how can I say, such an, a, a destabilization, destabilization of North Korean regime, mm -hmm. it was rather right-wing party or conservatives who voiced very strongly for unification, right? Because they, for them, unification is a sort of German way as West Germany, you know, integrated, incorporated uh, East Germany, they wanted really just to occupy North Korea. But, you know, usually Korean capital, they had the biggest stake in unification mm -hmm. for using, you know, these workers with whom they can communicate compared to other foreign workers, right? Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, so I'm, I'm, I'm not a... I'm neither pro-unification nor anti-unification. I think that unification is one of the options that Koreans are having for now, right? So the, the, the most important, what is most important to me is what's the way for, for people who are living in both Koreas, in Korean Peninsula, right? So what could bring them to the more peaceful or more, more humanitarian way of life. If unification is helpful to it, I will stand for this. If unification is not for this in a given situation, I will rather reserve about this. But depending on the change of situations, unification can be an imminent task or ultimate task, or we can leave it to the flow of history. So I'm rather very pragmatic about the question of unification. So the primary standard or primary uh, the, the, the primary goal of those options, which options we are taking, depending on what could bring the Korean people, people are living in Korean Peninsula to the happiness or more, more satisfactory everyday lives, something like that. Yes, of course. Um, it was, um, um, for, you know, a, 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 any student of modern history, history learns about, um, for example, Hyundai Corporation's um, assertive engagement with North Korea um, in the name of Tongil and and unification, right? Um, yeah, um, let's see. Uh, what do you think? Should we go to some uh, questions from the audience or, yeah? Okay. All right. Uh, let's see, Gary Park here. Um, Gary Park, he's a... Uh, yes, um, yeah, please use the microphone. So. Gary Park is um, retired recently from um, the English literature department here. And he's a uh, fourth, third generation Korean, Hawaiian, and also a writer and activist himself, and comes from a family of um, independence uh, fighters. Um, so his, he has a very broad question on imperialism. Um, there seems to be always a need by imperialist ruling classes to implement state violence to keep the rebellious elements of Korean society repressed. Universe, the unity of Korean royalty Yangban, Japanese Chinese to keep down Tongak in the post-World War II period, including the events of Kwangju, assassination of Kim Gu, plus many more examples. What is the class analysis that will lead to a viable, concrete plan of action of getting rid of imperialism? 
this is a very big theoretical question. I, I think um, I could readdress the question like this, Jian. So is, is imperialism in South Korea, in places like South Korea today, a, still a relevant system? Imperialism um, as a kind of a semi-peripheral, as South Korea itself wants to become a kind of a small imperialist. Um, but also imperialism um, um, that has uh, still remained uh, historically. Yep. Uh, great question, um, but very difficult to be answered. But I think the class analysis may lead us to a quite different interpretation of the past. I mean, the, for example, Dong Ak. Yes, they, it's a movement against Japanese imperialism, but on the other hand also, it's a movement against Yang Ban and the ruling classes. But if we put an emphasis on, on Dong Ak as an anti-imperialist movement, we may easily forget the class character of Dong Ak movement. Also, I mean that, you know, from the viewpoint of recently developed, not recently, but subaltern studies that Indian scholars had developed, even within the class, there are subalterns, right? Even, for example, nowadays in Korea, South Korea, I mean, being unionized worker, being a member of Minno Chong is a very privileged position, man. Because most of the workers, they are outside the unions, and that there's, many of them are irregular workers. So the class analysis may lead us to a different, different history, I think. So, yes. So, um, so Jian, what you're saying is that um, um, with major uh, popular uprisings in um, Korea's modern history, mm -hmm. there are many levels. There, yeah. there is an anti-imperial level, but also there is an there is a uh, a class is a, yeah. a class, very, level very class level tied to it too. Yeah. So, could you apply that to even uh, to the events of Gwangju? Uh, anti-imperial as kind of anti-U.S. Um, but at the same time, was Kang, was Kangju, Kangju a class um, uprising as well? I'm not sure in the case of Kangju. It's, um, it's uh, in a sense, actually, it was triggered by the arrest of uh, Kim Dae-jung, but it was more historical, history-ridden revolt rather than very contemporary class-ridden revolt. That's my, in Masan, Ma, 1979, Masan and Busan, Busan Masan, we can see a certain class element mm -hmm. actually is very, very important in understanding Puma Hangzheng in 1979. But in 1980, Gwangju, I think it was triggered in a different, different context. Later, later generation began to interpret Gwangju in their own way. So, so memory studies, memory one, right? Memory of Gwangju in the contemporary Korea, yes, it contributed very much to democratization movement in 1980s. But on the other hand, it, in a sense, it mythologized also some part of the movement. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we need a mythologist, right? Yes, yes, of course. Of course. Um, yes, and uh, another question from Professor Young Park. She's an anthropologist here. Mm -hmm. um, oh, her, her question. So what are your thoughts on the right-wing new rights critique of Korean nationalism? Um, that is, for example, um, Young Hoon Lee's uh, recent book, Panil Chong Jok Jui. I think you wrote about this. No, no, I didn't write this because, no, Young Hoon Lee is a very good scholar as an economic historian. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I always accuse him. You should go back to Koryo dynasty because <laughs> his history works on Koryo and Joseon and Nobi. Mm. It's a really excellent work. Mm. But certainly if he comes to the contemporary history, mm. it's, he is a little bit lost. But I think that this Banil Jongjok Juyi is, is too much. He, uh, his book or his statement carries too much outrage against Korean nationalists. 
too much outrageous for me. He, he feels too much outrageous. Also, for me, the Ion is a nationalist, very much nationalist, very much nationalist. So I, I don't see the difference in their spirit in understanding nationalism between Ion and so called uh, Korean, the authentic nationalist. But Ion and the Kim Moon Su, they were the first generation of the, uh, how can I say, certain uh, Funaro to, to the factory. In early 1970s, they just disguised and they, they got the job in the factory as a disguised worker and as a Marxist. They, they did it. But I think that where is the reason of converting their political uh, stance such a drastically? For me, till the 1960s, you know, the North Korean economy was better than South Korean economy. So I do remember still, as a student in 1970s, I didn't think, yes, socialist plans economy is the most effective way of modernizing Korea. So especially when we read, you know, the uh, controversies of transition from capitalism to, uh, no, from feudalism to capitalism and Marxist capital, we used to interpret this uh, sort of textbook of the, about the way of modernizing rationally and very, very quickly South Korea. Then after the collapse of the Cold War, it proved that we could know that the uh, planned economy was much less effective than market economy. So it means that it's still modernization is the main goal for those uh, so-called new rights uh, scholars, some of them whom I know personally. So I think that that's why they were converted to the very strong a right-wing, right-wing nationalists. But they don't recognize they are real nationalists, but I think that they are uh, nationalists very much in their spirit. So this is more complicated than has been thought. And Kim moon soo he was the most, most leftist, you know, union movement activist in 1980. He was one of the most beaten activists by the, you know, Korean state violence apparatus. But after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, I heard that he, he wept for three days and nights. <laughs> and then he found, yes, uh, this Soviet Union is not any more future for Korea. Then he was converted to the right wing or Park jong modernization way was more efficient and effective than the North Korean or planned economy and so on. But that's my, my. Yeah, thank you. I, you know, I, I think this is um, still mm -hmm. a major question um, for especially uh, those of us um, living outside of um, South Korea. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we even consider even the concept and notion of Panil Jongjok Jui. I mean, is this even real? In, is this even a real social phenomenon in, in South Korea today? You know, we, we begin with questions like that. Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, he, he makes the news in a very sensational kind of way. Mm -hmm. But the Hispo was m became a more sensational news in Japan when it was translated into Japanese. That's right, that's right, yeah? that's right. So, I mean, that also the, the Yeong-un's nationalism is problematic in that he cannot really understand the circulation of his ideas transnationally, right? So, I mean, the, he, he should ha have been very cautious of the Japanese translation, even though he believes in his argument. In, but once it was circulated in Korea, and the circulation in Japan, it has totally different connotation. So in a sense, his book, you know, cut off Japanese audience, Japanese readers. Oh, we Japanese colonialism did some, some, some good things to Korea, so we don't have to have, keep a critical memory of Japan. So in a sense, it, it, it cut off Japanese readers more than Korean readers in the sense. That's my... Thank you. Uh, we can talk about that more later, uh, but we have some 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 very important mm -hmm. um, uh, questions coming from the audience, mm -hmm. and this is a, a very um, big 
question and related to something that you mentioned before. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned there is an option, that unification is a potential option. So what would you say are other avenues available for the two Koreas? You know, the, about 20 years ago, as when I was at the, one of the editorial board of Dang Dae Pyong, just half joke and half reality, we used to say, oh, we want multiple Koreas. <laughs> so <laughs> find one Korea. But we can even separate the North and South into multiple Koreas if these multiple Koreas can certain a guarantee so better life, better life conditions for Koreans. Of course, it's depending on the conditions. But I mean that I really want to open uh, our, my, our way of thinking about the future to the really, really potential options. So multiple, even multiple Koreas in the extreme way can be an option, right? So, but it means that it can be a very realistic option. No, no, perhaps not. Perhaps unification is still one of the most realistic options, but at least we need to open our ideas to different options. If unification is the only option that we have, the, um, the space for our maneuvering will be very much restricted. But if we open these, our ideas to various options, we can be more flexible. And in very paradoxically, that kind of attitude can precipitate unification in a sense, more than sticking to unification. That's my answer. Another uh, important question mm -hmm. here. Um, we talked about Gwangju, and um, the question is, do you think there is a distinction between what happened in Gwangju and uh, the later evaluation of Gwangju as a democratic movement? No, distinction is uh, too much, but there's always a certain uh, gap between the, what has happened to the past in reality and what has been interpreted in reality, right? And interpreted. So, I mean, this is, this is you know, very general to every sort of interpretation. So Guangzhou is not the exception in that way. But I think the the person asking the mm -hmm. the question is is interested in finding out what were um, other agenda or what were some other important goals of Guangzhou uprising other than the democratic aspect. Uh, yeah, I think that it opened Korean society to quite, quite uh, improbable thought previously. I mean, the, for example, in 1979, after after the assassination of Park Jong Hee, the whole the, the spring of 1980, the whole university campus were in turmoil. But at that time, there was no mention at all against American imperialism. Only after Gwangju, we could see that certain a anti-American imperial slogans in the in the, the democratic movements in South Korea. So, in that sense, Gwangju was a really, really certain you know uh, landmark to change the direction of Korean uh, Korean democratic movement. It was it makes made a big difference? Yes, sure. So we have another question, mm -hmm. um, and this person remembers your uh, last uh, presentation here at CKS 19, in 2017. You talked about Poland history mm -hmm. and victimhood nationalism, um, especially in relation to mm -hmm. Poland, and but also Korea and Japan. Um, mm -hmm. Today, mm -hmm. as we talked about the comfort women issue and the forced labor issue, Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, Carl, many thanks for your question, but a, I translate victim of nationalism into 희생자 의식 민족주의. But uh, it's, uh, in 희생자, English... 희생자, not 피해자. Yeah, but in English I use the term victim of nationalism, mm -hmm. but actually 
victim nationalism appears on the scene when the people's consciousness begin to shift from victims to sacrifices. Sacrifice is a sort of a willing act to sacrifice oneself for the something, something public good, like for the nation and for the fatherland. So it's certain sublime, sublime of the wording and the consciousness happens in a shift from pieza to hisengja, from victim to uh, sacrifice. But uh, you are right. I think that the a Korean nationalist historiography, especially in this century, 21st century, is very much imbued with uh, hereditary victimhood. You know, you hear the uh, Baek Taehyung and the Kim Ji-young and myself, we were born after the uh, liberation of Korean Peninsula. So theoretically, we cannot be victims of Japanese colonialism. But even nowadays, today's gen young generation re tends to regard themselves as victims of Japanese colonialism. That's the same, same in Israel. The, can you imagine how on earth can the young Israeli soldiers oppress the young Palestinians in such a brutal way? Because they think that, oh, we are victims of Holocaust. In order not to reiterate Holocaust victims, we should keep our country strong nation. And for the strong state, you know, those some, some, some several dozens of Palestinian youths can be, can be you know, victimized. Because six million people will die. It's just, you know, several hundred people. It's not. That sort of psychology works out behind a Israelis a conscious. But the biggest difference between Israeli historiography and Korean historiography is that in Israel, there is a very strong uh, revisionist historians who are very critical of Zionist interpretations. So they are very much concerned about the uh, Israel state's violence against Palestinians in 1948, 49, in 1950s, and Six Days War, and something like that. But in Korea, still, Korean historians, especially who are working on Korean history, are very much still obsessed with the idea of that Koreans had been victimized by the Japanese colonialism, then American imperialism, then Cold War, and so on. But I'm sorry about the numbering, but if you have a look at the, how many Koreans were killed during the Asian Pacific War, you know how many? According to Korean uh, newspapers in 1945-48, it was about 70,000. And the UN, UN report on the, this, uh, you know, the casualties in the Second World War so reiterate uh, 70,000. And very conscientious uh, Japanese historian Yoshida, uh, Yusuke, Yoshida Yutaka estimates recently uh, 200,000. But still uh, that number is not that high. But if you look at the TV dramas and cinemas, Oh, several millions of Koreans were killed <laughs> during the Asian Pacific War. But that's not true. But if you have a look at Korean historiography of the colonialism, you can see no Korean historian talked of the number of Korean victims. That's also a very, very strange phenomenon. But in Poland, you know, six million Poles were killed. The, about a quarter, less than a, slightly less than a quarter of the whole population was killed. And yeah, it's Jews, six million Jews. And in Indonesia, three million Indonesians were, were, were starved to death under Japanese occupation. So, I mean, yes, Korean was Korean nation was victimized by the Japanese colonialism, but one cannot say that Korea was the most victimized nation by the Japanese colonialism. Thank you. Uh, we have another very important question here. So um, in the latest constitutional amendment proposed by the president, um, the proposal is to now include the Kwangju May spirit in the preamble of the constitution, but not the candlelight movement. Um, mm -hmm. So from a uh, historian mem memory activist, do you agree with this kind of 
uh, changing of the constitution or inclusion of the Gwangju spirit into the constitution. Um, in this context, when does the present still going on and very relevant end and turn into a historical event? Yeah, I mean, the, then the, we should, uh, before that, we should talk about what is the Gwangju spirit? Who will define Gwangju spirit? I mean, this sort of, you know, historical interpretation is always involved in a sort of political act, political action, right? So still, before that, we need to talk about what's the Gwangju spirit and what's the spirit of Gwangju. And then I think that the Gwangju spirit can be interpreted in the recognition of the rights of people's, what's the, the, um, People's right of people's revolt against the a against the a, a not right politically right political power and something like that. but also it may lead us to a question what is political right power it's still it's a very I mean amendment of con the constitution is a very very uh, crucial one so before that we need to talk about we should discuss. Was the Guangzhou spirit? But, but if if we make a consensus of this, so why not? Why not? No. Thank you, um, Professor Beck. Would you like to ask the final question? May I join? Yeah, please, please. please. Uh, thank you very much. Very. Get this wonderful uh, presentation, and thank you very much, Professor Harrison Kim, for excellent moderation. And I really enjoyed all of your talks today, and uh, I, I think uh, this will give us a lot of you know agenda, continue to pursue and continue to think about. And uh, I believe uh, you were kind of extraordinary scholar in that educating Korean intellectual community to think beyond you know, Korean nation. Many of us outside of Korea often think that Korea thinks Korea is uh, the center of the world and uh, all of the newspapers uh, outside should or are discussing Korea as a core news materials. But in reality, we are often surprised to see that uh, Korean was not always considered as a center. And Korean perspective is sometimes is not compatible with international standard and sometimes uh, interpreted differently if it is put at an in international uh, setting. And uh, I, in that sense, uh, all of this discussion to go beyond the pre-existing uh, historical identity or nationalism or or the legacy we are carrying to build our future is very important. And all, all of the discussion that we had is very, uh, use, uh, I think, uh, usefully insight, uh, enlightening. Uh, with regard to uh, your comments on the memory of uh, Gwangju and the way how current Korean political community tries to deal with a uh, uh, historical kind of interpretation of past, uh, I think it's very interesting. I'm not sure whether you have read uh, the Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf, Mein Kampf. We read them when we were young. Yeah. And it is still being sold in Korea. But you know, in European context, it is against the law, I think. I understand. And currently in South Korea, reading uh, Kim Il-sung's memoir is a big problem, whether their publication should be allowed or not. That what makes this kind of cultural difference, especially dealing with some idea that could be you know, challenging to the main current thought? And we learned in our past democracy move, democratization move, movement that uh, sometimes some kind of challenging thoughts could be you know, said, and we can discuss and get over it, not by banning directly. So in that sense, I really agree with your comments that there should be more intellectual discussion and dialogue and criticism against each other rather than jumping it 
you know, into kind of bringing the case to court and uh, ask the either prosecutor or judge to make decision on behalf of the whole society, whether civil society intellectuals should take more action. So I agree. And, uh, but uh, related to that, recently in South Korea, as you know, the uh, South Korean government has taken a measure to you know, stop sending leaflets to North Korea. That is, uh, uh, in my opinion, very similar to uh, kind of uh, the way how people are raising in that. It could be viewed as a restriction of freedom of expression of those North Korean defectors. But to me, the situation could be slightly different, I feel, because uh, we have experienced uh, the psychological warfare in old days because we were reading leaflets from North Korea. We were constantly hearing the so-called North Korean broadcasting sent short waves. And all those psychological warfare was, to, to us, an uh, extension of an ongoing Cold War. Mm -hmm. So to achieve a permanent peace, we might need to at least uh, build some measure to lead to reconciliation and collaboration, eventually leading to some coexistence and even unity or unification. What do you think about that? That would be my question. I so, I'm sorry to talk too much, but I'm really excited to hear and learn from you all of these wonderful things. Thank you very much. I think that the real problem in Korea is that we are still living in the Cold War era in our mentality. But you, you are more experience in the student activism, but while we were students, right, we didn't have uh, enough choices. We had to choose between anti-communist propaganda and communist propaganda. <laughs> so <laughs> we didn't have any, any, any materials regarding the sort of gray zone, right? So we have been uh, accustomed to think of everything in a very simple binary. So sometimes I, I, I found myself still caught in that sort of a binary of Cold War thought. Mm -hmm. But the, the reason why I couldn't be a little bit, I could a little bit earlier escape from that Cold War period, Cold War mentality is that I could witness the reality of really existing socialism in Poland. So in 1990s, I, I, I dedicated whole decade of 1990s to the history of Poland. Mm -hmm. So I used to go to Poland whenever I got some funding or travel grant and so on. So in a sense, a, my encounter with the reality of Poland actually a, made a rupture mm -hmm. uh, of my Cold War mentality, mm -hmm. which has been inclined towards uh, communist propaganda, mm -hmm. right? But, but still, I think that we Koreans didn't have such a chances, mm -hmm. and the real chances, lived experience, uh, you know, to, to get out of Cold War. Because, as you said, still, still our system, our intellectual system is caught by that sort of a shadow Cold War, you know, mm -hmm. the censorship one, mm -hmm. the Kim, Kim Il-sung's memoir. Mm -hmm. I think that it is also quite a lot of lies are uh, included in this. Yeah. But still, our young, our young guys need to read this with a critical, even though, even in order to certain uh, promote their criticism of the really existing system, mm -hmm. not as an ideal ideology, but as a reality of political power, mm -hmm. right? We need ask our young boys and girls to read this. Mm -hmm. Even in Germany, the Hitler's Mein Kampf was published a few years ago because, ah, yeah, yeah, it's, it's an Institute of Contemporary History in München. Mm -hmm. they, they made a very elaborated uh, comments. So one third of the whole book is consists of their critical comments of uh, Mein Kampf, but the whole Mein Kampf was published. Mm -hmm. Do you know why? Because the... Um, was the uh, Intellectual copyright, uh, copyright yeah. of this Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf would finish soon. Uh -huh. So after that, the finish of copyright, then any publisher theoretically can publish Mein Kampf. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Germans think that 
thought that, oh, without any critical comments from Mein Kampf, if our, our young generation reads Mein Kampf, so it will be problematic. Mm-hmm. So they made a decision to publish Mein Kampf with a comment. I think this is a really smart way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So we need, to, we need to think of our own way of dealing with these history memory problems mm-hmm. in such a smart way. I agree. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You know, um, whether you're an activist or a student or a uh, veteran scholar, um, this kind of a critical thinking or, or the tools of formulate criticism is the most fundamental essential um, part of our um, um, actions. And I think uh, today uh, we got a really fine dose of how to think critically about history. Um, Thank you very much, Professor Lim, for joining us today. I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.